Hi, my name is Janice Krauss. I'm with Concerned Women for America, and I wanted to talk to you today about the challenges facing marriage in the 21st century. Even as early as the times of Cicero, we heard that marriage was the first bond of society. Yet today we're used to thinking of marriage only in terms of individuals, how children end up in poverty in single parent families, how children hurt are hurt even in materialistic ways when their parents focus on something other than their marriages and nurturing the children in those marriages. But Marriage is also a very important part of our culture. Across generations and across culture, marriage has been an important part of every generation from the beginning of time. Let's look at some very important statistics, some staggering statistics. 70% of people around the world say that marriage is for life. 90% of Americans will marry during their lifetime, and 70% of the people around the world say that marriage is a personal lifetime goal. The two-parent household is still the gold standard for most people in America. 66% of our population in the United States live in a two-parent household, married couple, family. And even in European countries, uh, the marriage is under attack today. Uh, many people, particularly in Southern Europe, say that marriage is irrelevant. If a couple love, to love each other and live together, that's all that's important. Marriage is nothing more than just a sheet of paper. So what has happened to marriage that it has come under attack in these kinds of ways? How did we go from a culture where marriage was considered essential and a central part of culture in all nations to a place where many, many nations consider marriage irrelevant. Marriage, I believe, is under attack in three specific ways, from cohabitation, from promiscuity, and from same-sex marriage. Let's look first at cohabitation. Today, cohabitation in many places is replacing marriage. 439,000 unmarried couples were living together in the 1960s. Now, just 50 years later, it's 7.5 million. And let's face facts, cohabitation does not work. Living together delays marriage. In the 1970s, about 60% of couples that lived together eventually got married within three years. In the 1990s, it's less than 40% who get married. Cohabitation is also a very unstable relationship. Problems like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, violence, promiscuity, these are things that are very rampant in cohabiting relationships. Divorce after a couple gets married, after living together, is 80% higher. In cohabiting households, children are far more likely to experience depression, disorders, and other forms of distress than children who live in married couple families. Preschoolers in cohabiting households are 47 times more likely to die compared with children who live in a married household. Half of the kids born to cohabiting parents will see their mothers start or end a relationship before their age three, compared to only 13 percent of those born to married couple families. By the time they enter adolescence, these children are far more likely to engage in delinquent behavior than are the children in a married couple household. Household. So co cohabitation is not good for the adults and it's disastrous for the children. Now let's look at promiscuity. Marriage is not just being replaced from the outside by cohabitation, but it's being assaulted from the inside by promiscuity. Infidelity is the most often cited cause for divorce in more than 150 different cultures. In Western countries, between a quarter and a half of all divorces cite a spouse's infidelity as the cause for the breakup of the relationship. Promiscuity causes problems within a marriage and it causes problems prior to a marriage. It diminishes trust between couples. It's a destructive escape when a couple starts having problems in their relationships. Promiscuity tempts really vulnerable people with sex that is supposedly free and recreational with no strings attached. In fact, before 1970, when California established the no-fault divorce, the spouse who wanted to end a relationship had to identify the other spouse as being at fault 
due to unfaithfulness generally. Since the 70s, though, no-fault divorce has gained grounds in several states. In October of last year, it was made the law across the country in the U.S. So marriage went from being a lifelong covenant to and a permanent contractual relationship to a non-binding and frequently temporary arrangement. So couples today think unmarried relationships and extramarital relationships anytime they get in trouble because they know the law won't hold them accountable and neither will society. So promiscuity is dangerous before you get married and it's disastrous after marriage. Now let's look at same-sex marriage, the third thing that is attacking marriage in today's culture. Society has now deviated so far in terms of morality that we are in utter confusion as to what marriage really means. Our foundation for traditional family values is frankly in danger of collapse. Since 2001, 10 countries have granted marital rights to same-sex couples on an equal footing with that of heterosexuals. Currently, six states in the United States recognize same-sex marriage. However, it's very important to note that recognizing same-sex marriage in this country has largely been a matter of activist judges ruling from the bench. When it's left up to the American people, 31 states have had provisions on the ballot preserving marriage as between one man and one woman, and that has been voted on by the people. So when the people have a choice, they choose traditional marriage. Sadly, our children have become the guinea pigs in this fight, and they have become the ones who have uh, been hurt the most by the social experimentation of same-sex marriage. Our culture says two moms or two dads are just as good as heterosexual marriage, that the only thing that counts is love in the home. Well, social science data says otherwise, and it contradicts decades of social science research that has consistently shown that children do best when raised by a loving mother and father. Gay activists claim that they are the victims of discrimination and bigotry and that they are being denied their civil rights. Town Hall columnist Gregory Kukul counters, same-sex marriage is not about civil rights. It's about validation and social respect. It's a radical attempt at social engineering using government muscle to strong-arm people into accommodating a lifestyle that many find deeply offensive, contrary to nature, socially destructive, and morally repugnant. Let's look at some specific data. Gays and lesbians have a shorter lifespan. The death toll from AIDS is generally unknown. The media avoids talking about it, but generally gays have a loss of 20 years of lifespan. Suicide rates of homosexual men are 3.4 times higher than the general male population. Syphilis and anal cancer are very prevalent in the homosexual population. Homosexual relationships generally last only a fraction of the time that most marriages last. Very few homosexual relationships last longer than two or three years. In fact, it's rare that they last more than one and a half years. Eighty-three percent of homosexuals report that they have been emotionally abused by homosexual partners. And 11 percent of the women and 23 percent of the men in same-sex relationships say that they have been raped, physically assault assaulted, or stalked by their partners. According to the Journal of Sex Research, only 2.7 percent of homosexual men have the same partner over their lifetimes. And lesbi lesbian women are 4.5 times more likely than heterosexual women to have had more than 50 partners during their lifetimes. These statistics are shocking and they're appalling, but they're a very important part of the discussion about homosexual relationships. Many of those who thought sexual freedom would be liberating have found too late and to their regret that the dregs of fortune's cup are bitter indeed. What we've learned to our sorrow is that the consequences of the decline of marriage and the breakdown of the family have not only negatively affected generations of individuals, the decline of marriage has undermined our social institutions and shaken the stability of our nations. 
In my 20 years of research, writing, and working in the public policy arena on these issues, I've found a mountain of studies, papers, and reports that agree across ideological and partisan divides that marriage matters. It matters for individuals, and it matters for nations. There is a longing in the heart of virtually all of us for someone permanent who will accept us unconditionally, love us wholeheartedly, always and forever. There's an emptiness in children that can only be filled by a mom and dad who are absolutely crazy about them and crazy about each other and are there for them consistently, always and forever. And there's a desperate need in our communities for the stabilizing influence of a married couple family as an anchor that will hold society's ship steady whenever the hard times come. Marriage matters in all of these circumstances. It is both a personal relationship and it's a central institution of society. Both functions are essential for an individual's happiness and well-being and for the effective functioning and stability of neighborhoods, communities, and nations. This two-pronged vision of marriage is an ideal that needs to be promoted in our communities, in our churches, and around our nation. And now as I conclude, I would like to leave you with this definition of marriage. Decades of social science research have confirmed the deepest intuitions of the human heart. As frightening, exhilarating, and improbable as this wild vow of constancy may seem, there is no substitute. When love seeks permanence, a safe home for children who long for both parents, when men and women look for someone they can count on, there are no substitutes. The word for what we seek is marriage.